Hello everyone, Mr. Holkern here, and today we're going to talk about paleoclimates, the Pleistocene habitats, and megafauna. So we're going to be looking kind of at past climates and go from there. Now, how do we know about the past climates if we didn't have, um, you know, ancient weathermen and, uh, and history uh, people writing all this stuff down? Well, it, paleoclimatology is looking at past climates, and we use proxy indicators um, as indirect forms of evidence that we can use to infer what the climate was like. So we're just basically looking at evidence, right? Uh, and they're called proxy indicators. Now there's a bunch of different types we can look at. Uh, we can look at the chemistry side of isotopes of, of, of different elements. Uh, tree rings we can look at where pollen is. We can look at uh, kind of layers. It's kind of like a tree ring, but in, in a lake. We can look at the layers of the sediment in a lake coral uh, beds, fossils of different animals where they are, and then uh, more recently we can look at some historical documents or paintings if there are evidence. Um, but we do have a lot of data, and so there's a lot of data out there. Um, some of the evidence that we can look at is we've already talked about, right? We talked about evidence that glaciers have left behind, so the, the presence of eskers and moraines um, and uh, kettle lakes, and, and so that's providing evidence, right, of what a climate could have been at a location. Um, isostasy. So we can look at how the crust of the earth has rebounded and flexes as um, a result of glaciers being on top of it. Right. So that's one way we can tell what a climate was like. Um, one of the main ways we can look at gas concentrations. So like how much carbon dioxide, how much oxygen, um, all of those types of things we can look at by looking at little gas bubbles, little air bubbles that were trapped in the ice. So when these um, glaciers form, um, they trap little tiny air bubbles in there, and it's like having a little time capsule of, um, of a sample of the air at that time. So what we can do from that is test to see different concentrations of different gas. Now we have lots of data. We've got 400,000 years of data um, from a few different places uh, down, in, down in Antarctica. Right? So we've been able to do a, a kind of a core of ice, we go way down deep and we can check the little gas bubbles and it provides us a, a wealth of data about what the climate used to be like. Now for air temperature, it's a little different. So air temperature, if we want to know, well, was it hot or was it cold back then, because again, we didn't have thermometers around back then, is what we can look at is just if you want to simply think of it as like sea bugs, like little tiny critters and that we find in mud cores and lake sediments. And what they do is they their body size kind of reacted to the air temperature and the seawater temperature at the time. So we can use the size of their bodies because, again, this is that idea of uniformitarianism, right? We, we look at what's happening now and we can infer based on what happens now to what happened in the past as well. So we know these critters, their bodies are dependent upon the size. Uh, um, or their body size is dependent on the temperature. So we can look in cores like this to try to look at um, what's going on. Pollen, right? Here's another example. There's a bunch of pictures of pollen spores. So we can use that to understand what's going on with uh, the, um, the plants at the time. Uh, tree rings, right? Tree rings, we can look to see if was it dry years or was there a lot of moisture. Um, we can get that. Um, and we use that all to build up this information about the uh, Pleistocene. Now with the Pleistocene, and other ancient um, climates. But the Pleistocene epoch started 1.6 million years ago, and you can think of the Pleistocene as the Ice Age, right? And there were multiple glaciations that occurred during that time, but the most recent one ended about 12,000 years ago. Okay, that's when it ended. So you had a, a period on Earth where we had glaciers, uh, continental glaciers, advancing to much greater extents than they are now. Um, so the most recent, um, global cooling, you can see here's the temperature, and you can see where this, the, the most recent, it kind of cooled down here, and about 12,000 years ago is when it started to um, warm up again, okay, and that was the end of the Ice Age or the end of the Pleistocene. So that was our most recent global cool, cooling where glaciers were advancing, and then again, since then, it's been warming up. Now, things that happened during this time, one of them was the arrival of people in North America. So by the end of the Pleistocene, um, humans had spread all over the earth. Prior to this, we weren't really in North America, but the fact that the glaciers were melting opened up a land bridge between Asia and North America, and that allowed um, Homo sapiens people to cross over that, um, that boundary. Now, uh, timing of it, you know, we'll talk a little bit more about later, is it's about 12,000 years ago, but we think maybe it might have been even before that. So that's kind of an area of active research that we're, we're learning about. 
Now, if we look specifically at what's going on with glaciers is right at that front is called the glacier front and you can see it's uh, icy, rocky, right? Not real exciting uh, going on there. And then a little bit further out, you get the outwash plain. And that's where uh, when glaciers melt, they produce a lot of water, right? So that water um, is gonna be uh, creating these um, meandering braided streams um, where there's a lot of sediment material. You get a little bit further out, you get to what's called the tundra and the tundra is fine, you know, but there's not as much water. And now you start to get plant life growing small, right? Cause it's not, it hasn't been um, ex un uh, uncovered from ice for very long, right? So it's gonna be small plant life. A little bit further out, you get the savanna. So now we start to get some trees, right? Because it's been a while since the glacier was there. So trees have had a chance to start to take over the area. And then lastly, you end up with uh, forest, right? So forest is um, that last phase where glaciers have been gone for quite a while and trees have had a chance to, to grow, okay? Now, I want you to kind of think about some of these questions before we move on to our next topic. First one, what factors would keep plants from going, growing in the region of the outwash plain? Okay, your answer there would be water, right? Lots and lots of water. Um, and that makes it difficult for plants to get a hold because it's just too much um, water. Next question, explain the change in frequency of trees as you move from the tundra to the forest. Okay, now for this one, right, same thing. Um, the trees become more prevalent, right? There's more trees the further you get away from the glacier. And again, it's because of timing, right? It has to, those trees have to have a chance to grow. Next question, would this change in habitat affect the number of kind, or number or kinds of animals found at different distances from the ice sheet? If so, explain. Yeah, sure, of course it would, right? I mean, different animals are gonna live in a tundra versus a forest, right? So we'll talk about a little bit of that more here in this next a section here, which is about megafauna. Now what megafauna is, it's uh, looking at past life, which is kind of getting into paleontology. So paleontology um, is the history of um, ancient life, right? Things that have been around in the past. And geology is, brings that in because we're looking at the history of the earth, including organisms that used to live as well. So paleontology is, is kind of a subsect of um, the geosciences are part of geology because they're closely related and understanding these plants and animals and how they interacted um, gives us a better understanding of what was going on um, during that time. So here's an example of several different megafauna that we've looked at in class, right? We did our megafauna land um, lab and we want to kind of look at, you know, these things were here and now they're gone and we want to try to kind of flesh out the idea of why they're not here anymore. One of the things we looked at were mastodons versus, versus mammoths and specifically their teeth, right? So if we look at their two teeth um, here, um, the mastodon has kind of a more ridgy, bumpy top, more similar to what we have, and the mammoth was much more flat, right? And the reason for that is the food that they were eating, right? So mastodons tended to live in an area that um, was more woody, right? So they were able to eat shrubs, um, stuff that had a, was a little bit tougher, Mammoths were almost strictly eating grass, right? um, and we know that from their teeth. So uh, think again about the tundra versus the forest, right? And as our climate was changing, how these animals were impacted. Um, because if there's less of something or more of something, that's going to be advantageous, or it certainly is going to change how a, a, a creature lives. So again, looking at why don't we have these things around anymore, and um, mammoths and mastodons, and, and the, their environment changed to the point where they just weren't able to be successful. And we'll, we're gonna look into a little bit more as far as why. Now there's a couple of theories why. The first one is the overkill hypothesis. The overkill hypothesis has to do with uh, humans, right? Saying that humans spread into North America and as a result, they um, ended up uh, wiping out the megafauna, right? All these big creatures that used to be around are gone. So this is that spread again, going way, way back to where we originated in East Africa, right? Homo sapiens spread all over the globe. And then right around the end of the ice age is when we were able to come into North America because the, the giant glaciers were gone, or at least they were disappearing. So again, about 15,000 years ago, again, this is an area of active research um, where we're at. So with that, it's, you know, number one, you know, the theory is that, well, we came on here, we were a new predator, we were really smart, we had tools, and we killed everything, right, for food. Or we were more competitive, right? So we were a competitor to the saber-toothed tiger, and we were eating its food, so it had a harder time surviving. So that's kind of the theory or the idea behind Pleistocene human competition. We were 
taking them over. And we know that we were hunters, right? 30,000 years ago, this is in France, we, we've got paintings. Um, so it was a big part of our early culture was this hunting gathering um, uh, culture. Now the second theory, so that's overkill, the second theory is overchill. And that's that the, the climate was changing, right? And the, as a result of the climate changing, that led to pressures that ultimately killed off the animals. Um, and so if we look at our, here's our temperature, right? And we go back to the end of the ice age, the ice age kind of ended and we had this period where it got warm. And then over the course of like 2000 years, it got cold again. And then it warmed up again and they call this the younger dryas. So the idea is that this kind of like zigzag up down was a real stressor for a lot of animals that ultimately led to their extinction before it finally kind of settled down up here. So that's an idea. Um, this little possible of like a mini ice age where um, the, the, the climate was just changing back and forth at too rapid of a, of a pace for animals um, to be successful, right? Um, and again, when, when that happens, right, we just talked about that. If you have warmer conditions, no glaciers, you're going to have more forests versus open um, savannas and, and uh, tundra. Um, so that's going to impact the, the, the types of creatures that are there as well. So what do you think, right? Humans, are we the cause or is it climate? Um, and the active research is there's really problems with both of them. If you look at just each one exclusively, the problem with overkill is that um, we don't have a lot of evidence that humans, we, we usually find butchering um, damage to bones and fossils if humans have been hacking them up for, for food or fur. Um, we don't really see that very much. Um, and, and we don't have a lot of sites where we have giant, just giant, you know, large amounts of um, animals that humans were, were hunting down. The problem with the climate change theory is that a lot of the losses were just in North and South America and Australia. Usually if it's climate related, we see a global extinction um, happen. And we don't really see that with this, which is a little bit different or interesting. The, land, the extinctions were mostly land animals, not, not uh, marine animals, which is also kind of interesting or, or not typical. And then um, we've had glaciations in the past. The most recent one wasn't unique. So why didn't the megafauna die off before? Why did they die off this time? Okay. So what happened? What is the actual current theory right now? The current theory is that um, the Pleistocene climate change happened at about the same time that Homo sapiens or we showed up on the scene, okay, or we arrived there together. So the, the current theory is it's more of a multifaceted, it's a little bit of both, right? It's not black, white, it's gray, right? It's somewhere in the middle um, where it's kind of a mix of all of these things that um, happen together, okay? So a lot of information there. If you need to rewind or go over that, please do. And as always, if you have questions, please feel free to reach out uh, to me and um, I'll, I'll, I'll help you out however I can. Okay. Take care, everyone.